Hi, everybody. You want to talk about Connecticut Yankee now? <laughs> so as we learned in the keynote last night, um, Twain's 1889 novel, Connecticut Yankee in, in King Arthur's Court, has been classified as, as science fiction by scholars as at least partially a work of sci-fi, largely due to its imagination of time travel. As early as the 1960s, H. Bruce Franklin characterized Connecticut Yankee as, quote, not only a piece of science fiction, but a classic piece, and one that is a good deal more completely science fiction than has, has ever been recognized. Our fair symposium organizer, Nathaniel Williams, um, has labeled Connecticut Yankee as a technocratic exploration novel and an Edison aid, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Much of the humor, as well as the pathos and violence of the novel, function through anachronism, the overlaying of ideals and technology of late 19th century America onto medieval England. When the hero Hank Morgan bests his rival Merlin through superior knowledge and, more to the point, firearms, or kills tens of thousands of knights by juicing huge amounts of electricity through their metal armor, then finishes off the rest with Gatling guns, this visitor from the future conquers and destroys a less technologically advanced society in ways not too dissimilar from later science fiction tales about aliens or time travelers. Such anachronism is key to science fiction's distillation of imperialism and colonialism. John Reeder has studied how, how both early science fiction and late 19th century anthropology framed contact as a kind of anachronism, an incongruous cohabitation of the same moment by people and artifacts of different times. Science fiction, Reeder argues, deploys technology as a way to represent conflicts between perceived con confrontation of past and present or projecting it into a confrontation of present and future in order to indirectly consider conflicts between colonizers and colonized subjects. Hank Morgan is, as we talked about, as Bruce talked about earlier, um, above all else, a technocrat. At the Colt Arms Factory in 19th century Connecticut, he learned his trade. Cannon, boilers, engines, all sorts of labor-saving machinery. Why, I could make anything a body wanted, anything in the world, it didn't make any difference what, and if there wasn't any quick newfangled way to make a thing, I could invent one and do it as easy as rolling off a log. Morgan fetishizes weapons as labor-saving machinery, he combines his state-of-the-art know-how with an, with an American exceptionalist ideology to, to remake Arthurian England in 19th century New England's image, complete with, if you remember the book, knights on bikes, uh, uh, wearing sandwich, sandwich, board, uh, sandwich board for advertising, telephone wires, and though he does not share this particular blessing of civilization with the masses, weapons of mass destruction. The time-traveling Yankee reverse colonizes the backwards mother country in this way, but at the end of the novel, of course, and this is what interests me most, it all goes horribly wrong when Morgan uses modern technology to commit war crimes in the Battle of the Sand Belt, where, to, to stir your memory, uh, he murders 25,000 men with Gatling guns, landmines, glass cylinder dynamite torpedoes, and, most devastatingly, an electrified fence as he seeks to wipe out knighthood in particular, and feudalism in general, all in the name of American-style progress. When Morgan explodes the torpedoes, the front lines of advancing knights, quote, shot into the sky with a thunder crash and became a whirling tempest of rags and fragments. When he electrifies the fence, quote, a black mass was piling itself up beyond the second fence. That swelling bulk was dead men. Our camp was enclosed with a solid wall of the dead, a bulwark, a breastwork of corpses. And finally, when his 13 Gatling guns vomit death into the fated 10,000, the remaining knights are either mowed down by gunfire or drown in a ditch as they flee. In a span of 10 minutes after opening fire, Hank Morgan brags, 25,000 men lay dead around us. Ironically, the overwhelming success of their futuristic arms dooms Morgan and his few dozen followers as the festering dead trap them in their kind of cave fort um, and poison its air. On the advice of friends, Mark Twain deleted a passage in which he described the aftermath as, quote, some trifle over 4 million pounds of meat that is night. Probably a good choice to cut that. Um, as early as 1885, as he planned the scene in his notebook, he wrote, have a battle between modern army with Gatling guns, automatic 600 shots a minute with one pulling of the trigger, torpedoes, balloons, which that would have been fun, 100-ton cannon, ironclad fleet, ironclad fleet, and et cetera. So obviously, Twain had a particular interest in the gruesome and destructive effects of American firepower on a less technologically advanced society. Going back to Reader again, 
Reader sees the bare historical record of what happened to non-European peoples and lands after being discovered by Europeans and integrated into Europe's economic and political arrangements from the 15th century to the present as, as haunting science fiction's depictions of catastrophe, particularly in narratives featuring the invasion of, uh, by an alien civilization with vastly superior technology. One could argue that Hank Morgan is the embodiment of, of, of such an alien civilization in a single and, and singly acute Yankee body. Through Morgan, Twain offers a prescient account of the, of the violent ends inherent in the twin projects of American exceptionalism, exceptionalism and expansion. Of course, many others have already interpreted Connecticut Yankee as a satire on the dangers of imperialism that anticipates his more pronounced anti-imperialist writings um, during the U.S.-Philippine War, um, and also seeing, see this novel as predicting the violence of 20th and, and 21st century U.S. nation building. John Carlos Rowe's essay, How the Boss Played the Game, that's probably the most famous of these, so that's the only one I'm going to really mention here. Um, he describes the Battle of the Sandbelt as demonstrating, quote, the special horrors of modern mechanized warfare as they were revealed in the unequal battles between European imperial powers and pre-industrial peoples. The novel, Rowe argues, is, an, is a pre-1890 warning to the reader that the United States is already following the lead of the European imperial powers, a message he would repeat with growing volubility in the anti-imperialist writing from 1898 to 1905. Again, the row is not alone in, in, this, in this reading. Um, I have, um, yes, uh, William, William Spanos has a whole book on this in which he does a really kind of useful synthesis of, 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 of different eras of criticism on the novel. Um, Nate has a, has a good reading of it too. Um, reading the novel is, quote, both inherently critical of the imperial venture and, and pressingly aware of the way technology enables that endeavor. endeavor. And I think for me in, in this talk, technology is a really important and in, in particular interest to me, um, as we'll see in a second. So what I want to do, um, with apologies to the novel and, and, and to Nate, who, who thought this panel was about readings of, of famous novels, I'm, I'm going to leave Connecticut Yankee behind now, uh, because what I want to do is situate Twain's speculative militarism not as the beginning of a tradition of using science fiction to predict the future horrors of imperialist wars, but as an an inheritor of that tradition. Locating the onset of, of U.S. as an imperial uh, nation in 1846, at the outset of the U.S.-Mexico War, or if we follow Judith um, and, and set it in 1787 with the Northwest Ordinance, um, thinking of that as the pre-1898 pre uh, moment of U.S. imperialism leads me to seek a tradition of speculative comic treatments of advanced weaponry used for empire building, again, that precedes Twain's imagination of Hank, Hank Morgan's WMDs. So I, I want to historicize Twain's satire within that emergent pre-1898 uh, comic art, and, and, and humor to me is important, right? Uh, that addresses whether, whether, whether it's critiquing or celebrating or merely laughing at US imperialism. In doing this, I do not mean to imply that the predecessors that I'm going to talk about in the rest of this talk somehow inform Twain's imagination of Hank Morgan's orgy of, of technological violence against Arthurian knighthood, or even that Sam Clemens was familiar with these uh, predecessors. Rather, contextualizing the, the end of that novel within a genealogy of, 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 or maybe a canon, or my pun, canon, um, of comic speculative treatments of manifest destiny, US expansion, and annexation, allows us to situate Twain as part of a larger and more historically prolonged undercurrent of American writers and other artists concerned with, or at least curious about, the destructive direction of US empire. So let's play with Venn diagrams. Um, I think, for me anyway, in, in, in formulating this, it's, it's useful to think of the confluences of elements of science fiction, the comic, and US empire building in terms of, uh, in terms of a Venn diagram. Um, so this is how I've kind of set it up. But first, let's go through some things that don't fit. So what we're looking for here is right in that little middle there, right, the, the tiny little slice there of things that, that, that have all three of those. Here's ones that almost work, but don't quite. All of these were in earlier versions of this talk, and then I realized if I apply my own buckets and categories, I have to, I have to cut them. But I still get to talk about them. Um, so first, Simsonia. Many of you might know this 1820 novel, which has been described as like the first true American book of science fiction. Um, that there's a, there's a, a short passage in there that describes a, a vast machine of defense and war. Um, but though readers, many readers, including myself, have, have read Simsonia and laughed, it is not comic writing, right? Um, it's not a work of humor. Same thing with Edward S. Ellis's 1868, The Steam Man of the Prairies, 
Um, Nate can disagree with me if, if, you, if you think it's comic writing. Um, it, it, it features an anthropomorphized machine rampaging through the West, but again, it's not comic writing. Right? Same with the hundreds of Edisonades um, that, that followed, um, particularly um, the, the Frank Reed Jr. novels that I read about in, in um, Gears and God. If you haven't read the book, it's great. Um, all these works feature imagined machines of exploration and potential domination, but they don't treat them comically. So finding humorous speculative treatments of weapons in imperialism is important to me. Yeah, OK, partly because I'm a humor scholar, right? And when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Um, that's part of it. Um, but also because what a society jokes about offers a unique view into its preoccupations. And I think with imperialism, particularly its, its anxieties of the unknown. Okay. Um, so I've also excluded three comic pieces here. Um, first, uh, 1886, uh, Sam Davis's uh, hoax, A Typographical Howitzer, which is pretty funny. Um, it tells this ludicrous story of, of Mark Twain and fellow Nevada writer Dan DeQuill fending off an Indian attack with an old howitzer that they, that they stuff full of old printing forms as they're, as they're going to open a newspaper. Right? Um, mostly this is like to set up jokes about, about educating uneducated savages or unlettered savages right, by hitting them with letters. Um, it's violent, it's funny, it deals with empire, but the imagined weapon there is not a technological innovation, but, but an old, at Howard's there's an, an old mobile cannon, right? With it's just an improvised use of material. So there's not an imagined futuristic weapon there. So it's probably not science fiction. Um, I've also excluded uh, Edgar Allan Poe's 1839 story, The Man That Was Used Up. That's very funny. Um, it references the Indian Wars, it depicts a cyborg, but it doesn't really feature weaponry. Uh, in a sense, it, any weaponry is in, is in the past tense. Um, finally, post 1835 burlesque travel narrative, The Unparalleled Adventure of One Hans Paul. If you haven't read it, it's a hoot. Um, it's comic. It depicts balloon travel to the moon and, and some moon men and then coming back uh, with the moon men. It features some gruesome violence as, as Fall blows up uh, people who he owes money to uh, upon liftoff. Um, but in my reading, ultimately, his travels and travails are entirely personal. Um, there's not, uh, they don't really allegorize or even indirectly reflect colonial or imperial projects in, in ways that science fiction can do. Um, okay, so enough of those. Um, let's talk about a few pieces that, that do fit in. So there's five left that I think can count. The one you, you're probably most familiar with if you've been reading scholarship on this stuff um, is Washington Irving's History of New York, uh, first published in 1809, revised a bunch of times after that. This is like a, an early and remarkable use of science fiction to critique manifest destiny and, the, and especially the rationalization of westward expansion. Irving offers a counterfactual thought experiment to reconsider justifications for Indian wars and Indian removal by, putting, by using aliens to put Anglo-Americans in the position of the colonized. He imagined an invasion by the lunatics, um, not the saint lunatics who played with Nellie for a long time, but the lunatics are from the moon, um, visitors from an advanced civilization on the moon who are superior in knowledge to us and consequently in power as the Europeans were to the Indians when they first discovered them. The lunatics, the Knickerbocker reasons, are possessed of superior knowledge in the art of extermination, riding on hippogriffs, defended with impenetrable armor, armed with concentrated sunbeams, and provided with vast engines to hurl enormous moonstones. So there's our weapon, right? Um, they take possession of the earth based on reasoning from the great man in the moon who makes a speech that is a, a parody of the papal bull. Um, this description of superior firepower combined with the superiority complex um, should remind us a little bit of Hank Morgan, right? I think it prefigures his, his, his kind of self-justification as he seeks to destroy medieval knight errantry and feudalism, ultimately by destroying medieval knights themselves. Irving's Knickerbocker satirizes the arrogance of American colonialism through a unique combination of humor, irony, and speculative imagination of advanced technology. It's just one little part of this uh, much larger book, but it's, a, it's really unique. Um, but now we get to the fun stuff. Um, 19th century's greatest comic colonizer was, of course, Davy Crockett, um, a tall tale character who I've elsewhere in print labeled a comic shock troop of US expansion and imperialism. Several visual depictions of, of Crockett render him as a comic cyborg, a human turned into a weapon of mass destruction. In mid-century Crockett Almanacs, his transformation into a super soldier has as much to do with the exaggeration inherent to the form of the tall tale as, as it came through in comic almanacs, as it does with, with the recreation of, of, of Crockett from a real-life politician, David Crockett, an Alamo martyr, to a mythic hero. By the time of this, um, uh, the jingoistic publishers uh, Turner and Fisher, when they took over the Crockett Almanacs, Crockett, had, by this point, had fully evolved 
into a, a nearly invulnerable comic Superman who ranged over uh, the whole world doing impossible deeds. All of this is clearly in play in, in three visual examples that I'm going to show from one single uh, Turner and Fisher uh, version of the almanac. This is Davy Crockett's Almanac 1847. So the way almanacs work, 1847 almanac, almanac means it was compiled in 1846. This is the first year of the U.S.-Mexico War. It's also, importantly for these almanacs, a time of heightened uh, international tension between the U.S. and Britain over the Oregon Territory. Right? So there's some things I'm not going to talk about from, from this particular uh, almanac that, that sort of have a lot, have John Bull uh, and, and Brother Jonathan or Crockett sort of fighting it out over Oregon. Okay. Um, so overall, this almanac adumbrates American anxieties over expansion largely through Crockett's acquisitive and militaristic braggadocio. So this is the first woodcut. Uh, it's called Crockett Defending the Mouth of the Mississippi. If you can see the image well enough, it depicts a heavily armed Crockett riding a I think it's an alligator instead of a croc. I can't tell. Um, that, that essentially functions as a tank. Right? So Crockett carries in his right hand a rifle. Uh, he's lighting a cannon mounted to the alligator's neck with his other hand. Uh, on the alligator's back is, is a, a box full of artillery. So here Crockett's legendary mastery over animals, if you've read his stuff with bears, um, combines with his penchant for violence. And it turns him into like a, a formidable and mobile weapon. You see what he's doing there is guarding the Mississippi from foreign encroachment. Um, particularly in Mexico, but also Britain. He's not quite a cyborg here, um, but the fusion of animal, man, and machine transform him into a comic exaggeration of what was actually a real military tactic uh, in the U.S.-Mexico War. Um, famously, uh, Major Ringgold, Major John Ringgold's flying artillery, which was like the use of light cannons mounted in carriages pulled by horses. So this is, this is like the flying, uh, flying artillery, uh, but it's a Crockett-style version. Okay. A second image from the same on Almanac makes Crockett even more lethal. In Crockett blowing up a man of war by a flash of lightning from his eye, well, Crockett blows up a man of war with a flash of lightning from his eye. That's what's, it's a pretty good title. Um, in the accompanying sketch, Crockett explains that he got so angry at a pirate ship, that's a pirate ship he's burning, that, quote, my eye struck lightning, again, my flint, as the flash struck the pirate and sought fire to the powder magazines, and if the chips didn't fly, then there's no soldiers in Mexico, so tying it to the war. I picked up three heads and half a dozen legs and arms and carried them home to Mrs. Crockett to kindle the fire with. Crockett's casual bloodlust is his superpower. His anger, through his anger, he harnesses natural elements to explosive effect. Right? The use of natural phenomenon in, in both of these Crockett woodcuts presages, in a way, how, how Hank Morgan comes to power as the boss in Connecticut Yankee. If you remember, first he stays off execution by, by correctly predicting an eclipse and pretending to have caused that eclipse. Then he blows up Merlin's, Merlin's tower by planting blasting powder at its base, putting a lightning rod at the top of it, and then, and then waiting for a thunderstorm, and then pretending to invoke lightning to explode the structure. Right? Um, this purported miracle, which like all of Morgan's uh, purported miracles, is really applied science. Um, it, that, this is what makes him the boss, and this is what sets in motion the series of events that will uh, culminate in the Battle of the Sand Belt that I described earlier. One more Crockett. The page abutting uh, the sketch Crockett blowing up a man of war, um, yeah, right on the, 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 the page next to the sketch there, um, features uh, Crockett is more fully a cyborg, an amalgamation of human parts and weaponry. This woodcut is called Crockett Delivering His Celebrated War Speech. Probably the text is too small for most of you to read it. And I'm only going to read a little part of it. Um, his, let's look at the image, though. His torso is comprised of powder kegs, his arms of cannonry, his neck light artillery, his eyes shoot out a deadly gas, and his mouth fires what appear to be bayonets. I could be wrong, but I think it's bayonets. Um, in one hand, he holds a linstock uh, that he's using to light a cannon, and the, in the other, he wields two bolts of lightning. Um, so he's, he's a fully weaponized humanoid here, and, and he's delivering a speech that is full of, as usual for Crockett, violent and jingoistic rhetoric. In typical Crockett style, the speech refigures national conflict as an individual backwoods brawl. Um, so he, he turns like a... a, a public war into a personal fight. Um, it connects with the other images and sketches that I, that I talked about from the Crockett Almanacs um, in its weaponization of nature. Right? He's using thunder and lightning in, in the quotes here, earthquakes, crocodiles. All these things are used to chase away the enemy from disrupted, disputed territory. So, OK, so Hank Morgan, the connection's a little more tenuous here. He wasn't quite so prone to natural metaphors and backwards brawling. Um, 
but in his own war speech before the Battle of the Sand Belt, in which he delivers to a few, few dozen young followers, um, does kind of equal Crockett's in its, in its call to murderous violence. I'll just read one sentence from it. While one of these men remains alive, this is the Knights, our task is not finished, the war is not ended, we will kill them all. Loud and continued applause. One more example, this is the one that's in the program. Uh, so if you have a better look at it there, you can see it. This is an 1848 Courier and Ives print called A War President, Progressive Democracy. Um, so this, is, this caricature is 1848 Democratic president, presidential nominee Lewis Cass, who had been a Michigan senator. He was a, a hero of the War of 1812, um, an avid Indian fighter, and most to the point, an aggressive expansionist. This cartoon expresses moral outrage at Cass's uh, expansionism by mechanizing him into a mobile weapon of imperialism. The, the mobility is really important here because to get to all these places, you need to get your weapons there. Right? Um, sitting atop a wheeled cart, Cass holds a spear and a bloody sword labeled Manifest Destiny. His legs, belly, and arms shoot gas and shot as he mouths the list of lands to be conquered. New Mexico, California, Chihuahua, Zacatecas, Mexico, Peru, Yucatan, Cuba. The ironic label progressive democracy treats Cass's transformation from human to soldier um, to, to really to a, a marauding cyborg more than a soldier even. Um, it, it's not a technological feat in this critique, but it's a shameless deterioration of humanity and democracy. Right? It, it's, it's pretty clear what the, the satire is doing here. Um, so all, all, all the examples in, in this little mini canon of, of five pieces that I've created, whether or not they offer satiric critiques of imperial violence or they're just mining such violence for jokes, they all, they all I think, um, defamiliarize that violence uh, both through humor and, and through science fiction, right, in ways that interrupt, and let me get to probably today's only quote, only use of uh, Herbert Marcuse. Um, <laughs> I love Marcuse. Uh, what he calls a psychological habituation to war uh, that accompanies technological advances in weaponry. Marcuse worries that automating destruction diffuses, quote, personal responsibility, conscience, and the sense of guilt, and ultimately leads to repetition and escalation, increasing violence, speed, and enlarged scope. If individuals and governments that those individuals, individuals represent are made into war machines that remove human responsibility and thus humanity from war making, the worry here is that the result is going to be perpetual war. So the Courier and Ives print, um, the Crockett cartoons, um, despite their differing intentions, they all expose and disrupt the dangers of turning war into a mechanical and self-perpetuating process through what, what amount to absurdist representations which push the war's effect on the body and, and by extension the body politic into the, like, the ridiculous Bergsonian extreme of the cyborg. Right? It, it's, it's comical because of the mechanical encrusted upon the human. This is why I'm interested in, in, in seeing Hank Morgan's destructive and ultimately self-defeating te technophilia as an inheritor and an extension of a larger 19th century tradition of comic speculative treatments of advanced weaponry. As the US began articulating and also deb debating its status as an expanding empire throughout the 19th century, comic treatments of empire through imagined futuristic weapons registered American sphere, wonder, and ambivalence at the burgeoning, burgeoning imperial project. So as I end this talk and in, in in transition to Judith, who will tie these things together, I want to note that the, the work here is, I see is, is part of like my, my continuing efforts to, to answer her call um, in several places, including a 2020 version of the symposium, also in studies in American humor, um, to move the, the field of humor studies towards a more complete reckoning with, with American humor and matters of empire. And that's the best transition that I can give to, give to Judith. <laughs> Thank you.